Well, good morning. Welcome to Algona Free Church. So glad to have you here with us today and that it's an hour ahead and most all of you made it. And uh, maybe we'll have a few more friends joining us in an hour. Would that be right? Or no? No, they would have already been. I can't remember how that would work. Anyway, the, so we're glad that you are here and uh, celebrating this day together in the Lord. Next week, on the 17th, uh, we are going to have a memorial service for our friend Ruby Thomas, who passed away uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and there's going to be a catered luncheon following the service, okay? So catered luncheon means that you need to bring what? Nothing. Nothing. All right. That, well, yes, true. Bring yourself. Yes. Please come, or please stay. Uh, for it. So it'll be after the, after the morning service, we'll rearrange just a little bit. Uh, and she had that all planned out uh, for us to be able to have a, a catered luncheon at 1130, and then we'll have a memorial service about 1230, and then we'll leave for the graveside after that over in Brit. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention because sometimes people are questioning now at a catered luncheon, what do we bring? Uh, do we still need to bring something? Because we want to bring something, <laughs> and I'm glad that you do. Also coming up in just a, a short time is the uh, Todd Becker event that is happening, and so we're so glad that many of these posters have already gotten out in our community, in surrounding communities. Thank you for that. We still have several uh, places yet to uh, to ask, and again, as we ask for uh, the opportunity to, that it is a community event. Uh, it's uh, it, we want to be careful of calling it a religious event or a church event or that kind of thing. Uh, it it has that flavor, obviously, as churches are sponsoring it. Uh, but many times, people would be much more willing to. It's like, oh, this is a community event, open to the public and encouraged in the public, and it's in the high school. Uh, so please use that, and, and so we're very grateful for the, the um, uh, promotional and awareness that is already happening. And right away last week, uh, things were popping up on Facebook. Some of you saw that. On Instagram, uh, I don't know of other places that it might be, but even this awareness will be ramping up over the next few weeks. And uh, between now and then, we have our 30-day uh, prayer guide, and I hope you have that already and have been following it. And uh, we are on day seven, because it started last Monday. So we're on day seven, uh, even though it's March 10th. <laughs> okay, so uh, I know it can get a little bit confusing that way, but uh, glad to have that. Tonight we have our first training uh, for the uh, ministry counselors that are going to be part of that. And so we want to be in prayer for them and it. Let's see, I think I will let that be for now. Uh, let's see, let's stand together as we join together in music uh, worship. The call to worship taken from Revelation 5. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. And between the throne and the four living creatures, among the elders I saw a lamb standing, as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And then I looked, and I heard around the throne of the living creature, the elders uh, of, of the uh, elders, the voice of many angels, numbering Myriads and myriads and thousands and thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Declare his praise for 
when Jesus' blood came flowing down. Hallelujah for the cross. Hallelujah for the war he fought. Love has won, death has lost. Hallelujah for the souls he bought. Hallelujah for the cross. And when I breathe my final breath, I'll have to introduce a new song and if you've been to wow you know this one so sing out remember those walls that we call sin and shame they were like prisons that we couldn't escape. And he came, and he died, and he rose. Those walls are rumble now. Remember those giants we called death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. are dead now. This is our God. This is who He is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Remember that fear that took our breath away. Faith so weak that we could barely pray. But he heard every word, every whisper. Now those altars in the wilderness tell the story of his faithfulness. Never once did he fail. And he never will. This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. out of that pit he did he did who paid for all of our sin nobody but jesus who pulled me out of that pit he did he did who paid for all of our sin nobody but jesus who rescued me from that grave yahweh yahweh who gets the glory and praise Nobody but Jesus who rescued me from that grave. Yahweh, Yahweh, 
who gets the glory and praise. Nobody but him. This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. He bore the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Please remain standing for the scripture reading. Our scripture this morning is from Mark chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 9. Again, Jesus began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him. So they got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables, and his teaching he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil. And immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Another seed fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And Jesus said, He who has ears to hear... Let him hear. This is God's word, God's word for all people. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. We've all been invited to participate, as Dan reminded us uh, just a couple of minutes ago, in the daily prayer for the upcoming outreach event on April 3rd, the Todd Becker Foundation outreach uh, that we will be participating in. That's an important part of our personal involvement daily following the, the prayer guide. Hopefully, each of you has one of these and uh, are following it. Today's, of course, is uh, very important that we uh, pray for the provision of local workers. And the first of those trainings of workers is tonight uh, at 6 o'clock here. And we don't know who all is coming. So it's important that we uh, appeal to the Lord to bring those who are needed for our outreach event. Uh, the reason we don't know who all is coming is because there are other churches participating, and we do not have the names of those people who have been uh, enlisted, who have volunteered, who are committed to uh, being a part of our uh, prayer ministry. So with a, a one additional uh, point that I would make, and that is that next Sunday evening we would invite each of you to participate in specific time of prayer focusing on the outreach event. We will have two of these sessions, one next Sunday evening at 6, and the, the second one the following Sunday evening. So with those uh, preliminary notes, let's turn our hearts to the Lord in prayer. Father God, how grateful we are that you are the sovereign Lord that you are the one whom we can turn to in faith and trust, knowing that your will will be accomplished. May we be willing vessels used of you in whatever way you call us to be a part of serving in your kingdom. And Lord, as we think about the outreach event that's coming up uh, in just a few short weeks, I would pray that you are working mightily in the hearts of many people 
to prepare them for the message that will be given that evening. I pray, too, for those who will be serving as volunteer counselors, that each of us will be willing to be used of you in the appropriate way, that we will put our focus on you rather than on ourselves, trusting that you will guide us to provide the, the words that are helpful to the individuals to whom we are assigned. And Lord, uh, there are many who, who will be maybe not ready to, to make a, a commitment to follow you with their lives, but they will be interested in being drawn. Um, may you work in their hearts as well. May we be used of you to help them move forward in their investigation of who you are and the fact that you can be trusted and that you will provide the salvation that they need. And Lord, uh, as we think about the broader needs of our people, we do pray for uh, Barb and her family and uh, the passing of her mother. Uh, pray for your comfort your guidance, and certainly there are others among us who are dealing with uh, problems of various kinds. Uh, perhaps they are uh, suffering, uh, incidents of suffering or uh, challenges that they do not know how to respond to. Lord, may we each know that we can turn to you in faith and trust that you will provide the direction and the peace that we need. And Lord, we thank you for um, Pastor Dan and, and his leading us through the uh, book of Mark and the various messages. I do pray for him this morning that you will guide him by the power of your spirit to give us instruction that will be helpful in each of our lives. And now, Lord, as we uh, give of our tithes and offerings, I pray that your blessing will be on those. May we use those gifts wisely as our church seeks to honor you in our community where we are planted. May we be a light in the darkness of our, the world around us. May we be used of you, Lord, as you would have us to be. Thank you for all that you are. I pray in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> the high 
lights of your plans for us. Truths unchanged from the dawn of time that will echo down through eternity. And by grace will stand on your promises. And by faith will walk as you walk with us. Thank you for helping us worship today, worship team. I need to take my responsibility. The verses were wrong on the screen for the scripture reading because I gave the wrong reference uh, to the, I meant Mark 4, 1 through 9, and I put on the sheet Mark 1, 1 through 9. And uh, so I knew it was wrong immediately. It's like, it must have been me. (laughs) And then I, I asked, and yes, it was me. So yes, you have a fallible pastor, and uh, thank you for not blaming anybody else. It all comes back to me. Well, hopefully you can see past that as we get into Mark 4 today, and we're looking at a very uh, interesting passage, one that many people have heard uh, several times over, and as we do so, we want to uh, bring attention to what Jesus does, our hearing. In this passage, I know I'm dealing with 34 verses today, and yes, we will get them all done before noon, and it will help us understand, but Jesus, in these 34 verses, and the reason why I had to use all of them is because he talks about hearing from the beginning to the end, and so they were the bookends, and and throughout the passage, 15 times there's some reference to ears, hearing, listening paying attention. This past week was Read Across America in honor of whose birthday? Anybody know whose birthday? Dr. Dr. Seuss. That's right, Dr. Seuss's birthday uh, this last week. And uh, my wife invited me because I'm over 55, and so that means I'm mature enough to go into a classroom and read to third graders. And as I was Uh, there, I thought, well, you know, I'm going to do something a little different uh, for them. Uh, And so when I started uh, reading, I started, you know, I had the book, and I was showing it, and I was just reading what was there, and I I asked the girl sitting right there, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. And so then I was reading, and I'd turn the page, well, pretty soon. Well, of course, I'm amplified here. I wasn't amplified there. And so people's like, (laughs) <laughs> of course, the teacher had just told them, please be respectful. <laughs> and so eventually, after about a minute of this, they said, uh, sir, we can't hear you. And I said, well, whose problem is that? No, I didn't say that. I, uh, I said, well, you know, I was doing that on purpose because when we read, we need to read, uh, like especially as we're reading a story, we need to read it aloud. And I think it was on Elf, wasn't it? It's like, like singing. We need to say it loud and clear for all to hear. That's right. See, you, I know. And so then they're like, yes, that's right. Because sometimes when you're asked to read a lot, type thing. So I read it aloud, and then I went around and, and sat with them as some of them read aloud. And they did. They did a great job of reading. I was very uh, impressed with how well uh, they could read and how well they could read aloud, because I know that can be difficult. Well, I, so they could all hear just fine, I think. <laughs> but I needed to speak up. About 10 years ago, uh, Deb and I were in our home, and our children were either out of college or they were in college at the time. And uh, we were sitting there, as empty nesters do, wondering, you know, what do we do now that we don't have kids' activities uh, to go to? And, but uh, one of the things... Uh, I noticed is that our dog would come and sit at the foot of my rocking chair, you know, my, my particular chair. And if you ever come to visit, I'll point it out that it's my chair. And my dog would come and sit at my feet and stare at me. 
And I thought, well, this, this dog finally has it figured out, uh, that I am worthy of being uh, paid attention to. But Deb would say, do you not hear that? And I'm like, hear what? And uh, she goes, well, Pumpkin is whining at you. She wants to go outside. She needs to go outside. And I can hear it from the other room. You can't hear it, and you're sitting right next to her, or she's sitting right next to you. And that's when I discovered that, oh, maybe I've lost some of my high frequency. And sure enough, uh, even when we were sitting there together, that uh, she, would, she would be like, you, still, you cannot hear that. She's whining at you. No, I can't hear a thing. And, uh, and then I bridged that over to when Deb talks to me. Uh, the, Did you not hear that? I don't hear a thing. <laughs> so. But we need our hearing tested, don't we? <laughs> and that's what Jesus is calling us to in this particular passage. And as I went and got my hearing tested, uh, it, it confirmed what we kind of suspected. My, my upper uh, frequencies are gone. And they... Uh, said, well, you know, we do have some hearing aids that would help you out. And for, you know, about $6,000, we can get this, and that way you don't lose your upper uh, frequencies long term, because once it's gone, it's gone. And I said, well, $600, that doesn't seem too bad. But then they showed it to me in print. I said, $6,000, <laughs> whoa, uh, well, I think I'll pass. I guess I'll be deaf from there up uh, for the rest of my life. Uh, but, you know, I'm grateful for hearing aids, that they do help. Some of you have them on here today, and I hope that uh, they are helping you and that you don't turn them off uh, when I get turned on. So we're looking in the passage today, and let's pick up where Brian left off, because he gave the parable as given by Jesus. And we will continue on to find out what does Jesus mean when he says, He who has ears to hear we continue on, we're in verse 10. And in verse 10, it says, as soon as I get there, there we go. Verse 10, it says, when Jesus was alone, those around him with the 12, okay? So there again, we're just refreshing our memory here a little bit that Jesus has many disciples, but he has recently called specifically 12 to be with him. And so there were more disciples around him with the twelve, and they asked about the parables. And Jesus said to them, To you has been given the secret that they may indeed see, but not perceive. They may indeed hear, but not understand. Lest they should turn and be forgiven. And Jesus said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all parables? The sower sows the word. Verse 15, And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown, and when they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. These are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately, immediately they fall away. Others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word but the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that are sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. And, verse 21, we must continue. Jesus said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. 
Verse 23, those words again. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Still more will be added to you. And for to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. I'll pause there for a moment to reflect upon this portion of Scripture. As Jesus has shared with his disciples, with his next level of followers, the meaning of this parable of the soils. And yet, up and through verse 25, Jesus, I'm sorry, up and through uh, verse 20, Jesus has not given any command, any Uh, any response to this. He is simply stating facts. In fact, we're not exactly sure where do we place the emphasis. Is it on the soils? Is it on the seed? Is it on the sower? And we'll see that in the time to come where the emphasis needs to be. That's why I kept reading in verse 21 through verse 25 where Jesus explains it a little bit. Verse 23 and 24, he says, If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And you, in particular, those who are his followers, those 12 that were with him, you must pay attention to what you hear. Now, what is it that they were hearing? Well, Jesus said, What is sown is the Word, the Word of God. And as the Word of God was being sown, that there were going to be different types of soil, different types of people's response to the Word of God. And so, as the sowing was taking place, uh, Jesus doesn't come back with a, a soil analysis. He doesn't tell them to be good soil, and here are the steps to being good soil. He actually spends most of his time speaking about the unfruitful types of soil. What is it that keeps a person from hearing well, that it would take root and become fruitful? Not just become a sprout, not just become a stalk and have a hint of it, but go all the way to being fruitful. So Jesus is reminding his followers that as the word of God is going forth, it's like a lamp that is going forth in the darkness. And we don't hide it under, and especially in those days, not to hide it under something because a lamp was something that they could see around in in their particular place. Just like we might have lights for the day or in the evening, but we also have night lights, don't we? At least we do, and I'm very grateful for them because as my eyes have adjusted to the dark and as I might need to get up during the night or maybe the dog is barking about something, that I'm going down the hallway and there's a little light to help light my path. I'm grateful for that. So he says, pay attention to what you are doing with the light that is given to you. With the measure you use it, it will be measured to you again, but to the one who has not. What does that mean? And he's referencing to the person who lets go of the seed. In those three soils, maybe not right away, but eventually They let go of the Word of God. It does not become their full attention. And God says that even to those, you won't be given much more. Well, let's see. As Jesus is telling this, he's actually saying, hmm, is there any hope? Is there any hope that as we share God's word as we seek to listen to God's word that anybody will pay attention to it and that's why we keep going in verse 26 
Because here, God guarantees that some do hear. We don't have to live in disappointment. We don't need to live in hopelessness. He said, the kingdom of God is as. It's as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day. The seed sprouts and grows, but he knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full-grown grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. God is guaranteeing that there will be a harvest. Even as we are getting ready for spring, and I know there's some uh, spring fever uh, with some of the, well, maybe even with some of you with your gardens, but spring fever with some of the farmers. Oh, maybe we need to get out there. And we need to get a jump on the weather. But we all know that, you know, we have to pace ourselves <laughs> because the weather that we have today and tomorrow in the 50s and 70s that later this week will be back down in the high of the 30s. And there's this erratic time during the season change. But... The reason we plant is what? The anticipation of a harvest. Farmers don't plant seed. Gardeners don't plant seed with just the enjoyment of being out in the dirt. You know, we just love to see the dirt fly. And, and being a, a farming, being part of my heritage, I enjoyed being out in the field and, and busting up the sod and preparing it and, and uh, sowing and you know, that, that was exciting, but it was always with the intention of there's a harvest coming. Otherwise, we're investing a whole lot into we're <laughs> flushing it down the drain if there is no harvest. But there is a guarantee of some sort of harvest, even though in farming there are no guarantees. We don't know what will happen in June, July, August, September. That's why we get crop insurance. But here, God says, you don't need to worry about crop insurance. You need to know that there is a guarantee of a harvest. So set your hope on that. Then 30, verse 30 says, With what can we compare the kingdom of God? What parable shall we use for it? It's like a grain of mustard seed. So here he gives attention to the size of the seed which when sown into the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth, yet when it is grown, I'm sorry, yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants, puts out large branches so that birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Not only is he guaranteeing a harvest, he is also guaranteeing growth. He's guaranteeing this process that takes place from the point of sowing to the point of harvest. That it will, <laughs> that it's like, well, I think this is harvest time, but I don't see any growth. And then poof, there it all is. No, he said, you will see the growing season. And it will take time. That, again, what he is referring to is the kingdom of God and Jesus has been speaking of the kingdom of God since the first chapter of Mark where he took over for John the Baptist and he said repent for the kingdom of heaven the kingdom of God is at hand and here he's calling them not just to a a movement he's calling them to a kingdom And they would understand from the scriptures that they had that he is calling them to the genuine kingdom of God. And yet many of them may have thought, being from Jewish descent, that they were already in the kingdom. We're God's chosen people. What do you mean? We, we might not be in the kingdom? I thought God already chose us. We're in. And yet Jesus is clarifying that not all are in the kingdom. And secondly, even if you are in the kingdom, there will be evidence that the kingdom of God is in you. 
the root of your life, the fruit of your life. But also know that it will take time. It'll take time. Well, how does Jesus wrap this portion up? Verse 33, Mark brings a conclusion to it by saying, With many such parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as they were able to, what? Hear it. Jesus did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. Well, what does this mean for us today? What is a a so what for us to consider at this time? Well, something for us to know. And this is is something exciting for me as I was uh, thinking through this, that Jesus uh, called for a soil analysis, but... He did not call for a change of the seed. Now, we have a a terrific uh, place just down the road from us here at uh, Pioneer Corteva where they are continually working at uh, what are the types of soil in Iowa and the surrounding area here in the Midwest and what works best in certain types of soil. And so they are modifying, they are Uh, they are causing a type of hybrid of seeds. They're adjusting to the soil. And there's nothing wrong with that in in that setting. But Jesus says nothing about changing the seed. He doesn't say change the seed to adapt to the soil. The message must not change change now we may need to adapt it yes adapting it to culture not that we're changing it for culture but we're adapting it to culture just like as i'm speaking to you here and even as we have the todd becker event here in a few weeks that the message will be the same but it's to a different uh, a, a different season of life adapting it so that different seasons of life can get it as we have children's sunday school for them to be able to understand what God is saying on their level, in their vocabulary, so that they might understand. But again, the message doesn't change. Even how we communicate the message, and one of the things that I've adapted uh, was that the Todd Becker evangelistic outreach And one of the reasons why I didn't want to use that in our promos, it's one thing for us to understand what an evangelistic outreach is. But to call it an evangelistic outreach in in the community, into the general public, they can misread that into thinking, oh, this is a religious thing. And is it religious? Eh, Somewhat. But... It's not specifically religion in general. It is very particularly the gospel that is Jesus Christ. So is it evangelistic? Yes. But the other thing that evangelistic or evangelical has become in our culture, not just here in Iowa, but in the United States, that evangelistic, evangelical has become a political term. Oh, this is a political rally for all those evangelicals. (laughs) Now, you and I would say, well, no, that's not what it is. I'm saying for the people that don't know, they only many times hear about evangelicals as a voting block in, in our country. And so to them... Evangelicals are a, a particular type of voter, uh, and, and whatever their type of voting is, well, it's, it's the radical right, or it, they're always Republican, or, you know, th- again, that can be how they interpret it. So that's why I wanted to modify, not change the message, but I wanted to modify so that it wouldn't become a stumbling block to people. Of, well, I'm not going to go to that, that's a political rally. I'm not going to go to that, that's a religious rally. Rather, it is a community event regarding life choices. And it very much includes the choice of Jesus Christ. 
And it is not for us to bend the word. And that has become all too familiar in Christianity today. It's one thing for the general public to not follow after God's word regarding various issues. But when the church, when churches start bending God's word in order to fit their their focus, redefining what sin is, and that's something that I appreciated even as we have our training tonight as I was doing review for it ahead of time, that it was speaking about what is the need? What does a person need to be saved from? Uh, What does Jesus bring into a person's life? Is it simply to make it a better life? Is it simply to help them deal with stress or deal with anxiety uh, or deal with disappointment in life? What is the gospel? And yes, we have a gospel that speaks into each of those conditions, but we don't modify the gospel in order to speak into that. Because ultimately, the gospel is that people are sinners in need of a Savior. They cannot save themselves. And that Jesus is the only hope. And that it is for us to bend to God's Word, not for God's Word to bend to us (laughs) or bend to culture. And too often that has become the adjustment that is made. Forever, O Lord, your word is established in heaven. We must be careful of easy believism. What is it, even as we deal with the soils, to realize that there will be four different soils. There are four different soils in this room today. There are soils that are receiving this. They're like, yeah, this is exactly what we need. And there are soils that are like, yes, I need to follow that. I need to pay attention to that. Uh, I need to be more fruitful. <laughs> right? But if... If what you get from this message is that you need to be more fruitful, you've missed the gospel of this message. Because the gospel is the seed. The word of God is the seed. And it's the word of God at work in us with the spirit of God that brings about the fruitfulness in our lives. That's why we have a passage like Ephesians 2, verse 10, where it says, We who are believers, who have been saved by grace, through faith, not of ourselves, not of works, lest anyone boast, we are His workmanship. We're created in Christ for good works. We're not our own workmanship of, I've got to do better, I've got to try harder, I've got to clean this up in my life. What <laughs> It is... Rather, to be in a constant need for the gospel of bowing to Jesus. I need Jesus in my life. I need God's word in my life. I need the transformation that happens in his spirit. That humility, as was mentioned in Sunday school this morning, of the adults. Otherwise, it just becomes another works religion. Of isn't it great how how much I have changed in my life. I used to be this, but then I stopped doing this, and then I stopped, and me, and I, and I have gotten to where I am. Rather than in humility saying, even after being a believer for 10 years, 30 years, 50 years, that I still am desperately in need of Jesus to continue to transform my life in his word, with his spirit. That when I stand before him someday, I will not be standing there saying, but Jesus, didn't I do this in your name? And I was a church member for my whole life, and I gave a lot away, and I did a lot of good things. And Jesus will say, depart from me, I don't know you. 
religious people. It's good for us to practice what we will say before Jesus someday because it's a good reminder for what the gospel is in our life every day. When I stand before God, it's like my only hope is Jesus. (laughs) My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood, his righteousness. I dare not trust the, the sweetest of frames, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. That's the, that's the life that continues to grow, take root, bear fruit. Because the, the soils that miss are those that get distracted, those that uh, get lazy, those that get concerned with all the other stuff rather than allowing Jesus to be the shepherd that guides us in all truth and through our lives. So something for us to do, to know, is that we must not change the message. The gospel does not change for people. We change for the gospel. Secondly, though, something for us to believe, something for us to be encouraged in, is that there will be a harvest. But we don't need to worry about the harvest. Even as I said in this room today, in the gym here in a few weeks, There will be all these soils going on, but we don't have to worry about any of them. We simply need to make sure that we keep getting the gospel correct. (laughs) Keep sowing the gospel. And even as young people and adults will be responding to the message that night, they might be eager to receive it, but we don't know what the end result will be. There is a journey this long time, lifetime process, and only God knows who and what type of soil a person is. And whether or not Satan will come in and steal it away quickly, or maybe they will hang on to it for a while, and they've had this spiritual experience that maybe at some point gets stolen away, or, or they lose it, and it's like, well, I guess that didn't work after all. And yet, no, 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 you're missing it. But yet, again, that's not for us to worry about. It's for us to keep joining with the Spirit, letting the Spirit do the heavy lifting, and we join with Him in continuing to sow the seed. Something for our heart to believe is do not give up on the perfection of the gospel. We don't need to keep changing the seed we don't need to adjust the seed at all we need to know the seed and secondly one of the things jesus doesn't tell us to do but it's implied is to keep spreading it spread it generously you don't have to keep doing soil analysis of well uh, this this area probably won't pay attention to god's word so we're not going to sow it there Uh, but these people we like how they look and so yes we're going to invest in them Jesus said, the gospel is for all. Keep spreading it generously because God has spread it generously. And there's more seed in the sack. (laughs) And we don't pay for any of it. It's all his. And so we don't have to be stingy about it. Keep sowing it generously. Because it's not the seed that's ineffective. It's the soil. That's why Jesus keeps saying, how is your hearing? How is your hearing? What is the fruit of the gospel in your life? And then last of all, what is it for us to do? Well, it's what Jesus said in verse 23 there, that 24, pay attention to what you hear. Because ultimately the hearer is responsible for, for what is heard and what they do with it. All hearers, what to do with what is heard, especially in regards to the gospel. What distracts me from listening? What is keeping me from paying attention and truly 
giving my life over to Jesus rather than, well, there's stuff I need to sort out first. Again, that's not the gospel. I think of people who sometimes you hear this, well, I didn't get anything out of church today. Have you been around that type of person? Maybe you've been that type of person. When I say type, the soils sometimes are adjusting constantly. And there can be times when I get done with a church service, not, not necessarily one that I'm the pastor and preaching in it, but for those years when I was out of ministry and going to church, I tell you what, it was a breath of life to me. I loved it. We could hear the truth. After listening to that, you know, the world's philosophy all week long in various ways, boy, this is the Word of God. And when being in a place where they are preaching the Word of God, exalting Jesus as the, as the gospel, that if the seed isn't working, it's because of, it's a soil problem. <laughs> it's not a seed problem. But when I was a chaplain at, a, uh, at the care center for a few years, uh, Newton, Iowa, where I served, when COVID was complete and I was able to get out on Sunday mornings, I would visit the various churches in Newton. Uh, and just to get to know the pastors, get to know how can we care for your people that are in our facility, uh, how do you reach out to them, how can we partner with you, those types of things have some face-to-face time. So I would go to the different church services, various types of churches. And I remember one in particular where they were following the liturgy, and it was fascinating that all the pre-reading of, uh, that, that led up to the sermon was dealing with the risen Lord Jesus, encounters with the risen Lord Jesus, the path, those that were on the way to Emmaus. Uh, and then it also had the Apostle Paul on the way to Damascus. And then I'm trying to think what the third reading was, but it had also an encounter with the risen Jesus. And so in my mind, in my heart, I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be a great message uh, about encountering the risen Lord Jesus (laughs) and how we ought to encounter him and have faith in him. And yet the pastor got up and talked about anything but Jesus, anything but the risen Lord Jesus. He talked about being vulnerable and how we need to, uh, you know, kind of let down our guard. He talked about, that was his whole sermon, it was about 10 minutes of how to be vulnerable. And then when it was done, they got back to reading the scriptures and singing songs that dealt with Jesus. (laughs) And when I got done with that service, as I was evaluating, I thought everything was biblical and Christ-centered except the message. (laughs) And that was all about us, how we can do better, and nothing about relying on who Jesus is. So yes, there are times when it is not our hearing that is bad, it is the seed that is bad that is being sown. So we need to be careful of what we hear from, even though it is a church or a certain preacher or a certain label that, oh, we should be able to trust what they have to say. Not necessarily. So let's pay attention. Having our hearing tested. The Bible says there are times when our hearing goes dull. We hear it, but we don't perceive it. We're not really tuned in. May it be for us the blessed assurance that we will close with here today. The only reason why we have blessed assurance is because of who Jesus is and the foundation, the rock of his word. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. I can't change it. None of us can change it. It must bend us. May we have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. May we have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to us. Shall we bow together? Thank you, Father, for your word that as you have various people in various ways that 
that proclaim your gospel, your word, that you already know that it isn't going to be 100%, that there will be all kinds of different responses, but all of that is in your hands. Help us, Father, as we, uh, not only as we prepare for the Ted Be- Todd Becker event, but even in our, in our daily lives, that we don't have to live in fear of the gospel and being embarrassed about the gospel. Uh, it's for other people to be in fear of the gospel <laughs> and to bend to the gospel, to bow to the gospel. And yet, not that we have to be mean about it or, or intimidating about it, but to have confidence that as we share it, that there will be a harvest. A harvest that is guaranteed not because we're such great communicators or great people, but Father, because you honor your word and the word of God with the spirit of God exalting the son of God brings forth fruit and there will be a harvest. And so we rest in that today and may we have ears to hear what you are saying to us and respond to it in faith and obedience. Amen. If you're able, would you please stand as we praise our Lord in song. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story. My song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. All is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. 
This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Praising my Savior all the day long. Hear now the benediction, a promise of the harvest. In Revelation 5, where John writes, I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Go in his glory. Share his glory with one another.